One, I've been advised that it's uh, 4 o'clock and we have a quorum, so I will call this meeting to order. And uh, you have the agenda. <coughs> uh, action item number one is the approval of the minutes of September 7, 2016. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Discussion. Ah, discussion of the minutes. Yes, it's here. Um, yes, I just have a quick question. Um, on behalf of the committee, I had asked for the ethnic distribution of students, um, but I don't remember getting an email or any follow-up. So is the committee going to receive that information? Uh, I'm advised by uh, <coughs> Mr. Patrick that we will be receiving that information. We just don't have it yet. Okay, thank you very much. But the minutes accurately reflect what you requested, correct? Yes, they do. Thank you. Any other comments about the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Uh, we'll now move to the policy calendar, and we have one item on the policy calendar, and that's a resolution requesting that we authorize Hunter to purchase audiovisual equipment and integration from something called CDWG under two existing contracts. President Rabb is here. Good afternoon. Uh, one of these is a City of New York contract for which Hunter will make purchases not to exceed $565,000. The other is a New York City Department of Education contract for which Hunter will make purchases not to exceed $333,000. These transactions will, of course, be pursuant to law and university regulations during the fiscal year June 30, 2017. Uh, what Hunter is doing, and President Rabb can share a little more with us, is upgrading the technology in its library. So it's converting much, much of its archival space into a state-of-the-art student success hub. Uh, when I visited Hunter, she pointed this out to me and was excited about it then, and I guess is more excited about it today. So why don't we hear from President Rabb? Thank you so much, Christy. Um, we're here to for seek your approval um, to use about $898,000 of tech fee money to invest in a project to radically transform the Hunter Library. Um, we're doing this in phases. The current phase, the third phase, is eight, cost eight, $18 million, all privately raised. And we are able to take two floors of a library. We're creating a student success center with student tutoring and pre-professional support. We have our first education library. Um, and a Macaulay Study Center, among other features. So with the $18 million, we've done all of this construction, and we're seeking approval from the board to use $898,000 of tech fee money to support the uh, plans for these two floors. So the money will be used for all sorts of AV equipment, laptops, other technology, um, and technical and digital support for the learning centers for the education library, which as our provost knows and has, was one of the great supporters, is highly advanced in technology and teaching and training our teachers. So this is something that our students have asked for for a long time for a transformation of the library and we are just about complete with the construction. We will be done and on time and on budget with an opening date scheduled for the end of January. And with your approval, we'll be able to have a state-of-the-art, completely technic technologically outfitted two floors um, right in the middle of the main campus. Questions or comments for President Rabb? Yes. Just a comment, Mr. Chair, just commending President Rabb. I, I'm a student over at Hunter, and being able to see the library progress over the years and stay on track. Um, so I think this is a great initiative, and thank you for making this your priority. Any other questions just or comments? Just a quick question. Yes. Uh, also, yeah. I commend you on raising the private money mm -hmm. and bringing it in on time. All tech fee expenditures are supposed to be part of a consultative process, faculty and staff. Did that occur? I'm sorry, and I... I excuse me for admitting that, we have a very, very active and large tech fee committee, which is actually faculty, students, and staff, and they've been very enthusiastic about this proposal and actually went through all the details of what the funds would be used for and unanimously supported our request to them before we came forward here. Great. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Uh, I might ask one question to uh, our provost down here. Are other libraries throughout the CUNY system uh, making these sorts of changes to the utilization of their library space? Trustee Sh um, Schwartz, the libraries at CUNY vary enormously, but I know of no um, initiative right now that's on the scale of, uh, of Hunter Colleges. It is 
It is a brilliant plan, again, being done in phases, but uh, right in the heart of the campus, it will make a tremendous difference in uh, student engagement and student success. Well, I, I don't pretend to be expert in this, but from what I read, <clears throat> you know, the utilization of library space around the country and places of higher learning are changing. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And uh, oddly enough, they are increasing right. in many cases. Right. Absolutely. Um, but, I laugh because when our donor made the $25 million gift that allowed us to do this the last minute, he said, I was about to write you this check, but somebody said, nobody's going to libraries anymore. I said, well, nobody's taking out, not many, as many people are taking out books, but more people are using libraries. So uh, as the provost said, it's, it's, a, it's not your mother's library, but it's, it's a very important initiative. President Mato. Oh, sorry, that, we, that we are with some capital funding beginning to also change uh, convert space that now houses uh, periodicals and journals which don't have uh, you know much usage anymore and move them to a different space and all the requests from the students have been to create yeah. spaces for you know sort of this kind of uh, group learning and yeah. uh, a maker space and and uh, things like that so so if, if this, Chancellor, is a movement towards best practices, I think we heartily endorse it and would like to see it apply throughout the CUNY system. Uh, I'll move the approval of action item number one on the policy calendar. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thanks for your Thank you, support. President and please come to the ribbon cutting. <laughs> <laughs> we will when you invite us. Uh, item number two is the consideration of the fiscal year 2017-2018 operating budget. And I believe both the Chancellor and uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Sapienza want to address us. And uh, Chancellor, why don't you go first? I'm, uh, as soon as let there be light, <laughs> I'm waiting for the screens. So, um, we're bringing to you, obviously, the, uh, the budget request, and this year, uh, for the first time, is in a four-year plan. Four-year financial plan that includes a year uh, budget request. The plan mirrors the four years of the master plan, which you approved at the last meeting, was, uh, and that was informed by a strategic planning process that's been going on for the better part uh, of a year. So the idea is, how we can achieve those goals in the plan and uh, what are the, the tools that we'll use to get there. And as you'll see from uh, the budget presentation from the, from the chief financial officer, there are a number of ways that we believe we can do that. It, of course, involves public investment, involves tuition, involves private funds, and it involves uh, efficiencies in our business operations to contribute to that as well. But what I want to do is sort of I want to start at about 10,000 feet briefly before I turn this over to Matt, because I think we can think about this. Master plan, as you know, is 100 and some pages long. You see the strategic plan, it will be longer than what I'm going to talk about right now. But what I want to talk about is what I think the essence of uh, this is about, CUNY's strategy captured in the master plan and reflected in our budget request. And so as we've talked about before, it's what we refer to as the connected university. And so the first thing I would say is that this is the challenge that New York faces. It's the challenge that everyone faces, but we're going to talk about it in terms of New York. In the knowledge economy, degrees matter more than ever, and most promising jobs require a college degree or a certificate or some education beyond high school. And the percentage of jobs that are required continues to rise. So if we want to equip New Yorkers with the tools they need to be successful, we need to get them more degrees. So the second point I'd make is that I think we'd all agree that talent is evenly distributed across all kinds of demographic uh, lines. But the opportunities for successfully developing talent have traditionally been correlated highly with income. Lower income, underrepresented students have been less likely to get the degrees that they need to be successful. So to overcome this, we have to do better. We have to meet our students where they are. We have to offer education in many different forms, whether they're two-year students, four-year students, adults uh, in, the, in the job market who need a certificate or retooling, uh, and the delivery of higher education has to continue to adapt. 
So uh, the most important in outcome for these students at any point, two-year, four-year, master's, PhD, certificate holders, <laughs> is to get a credential, to get that degree. And far too many CUNY students today leave before they have a degree or take too long to get it. And that's what we have to uh, address, I believe. Also, something that we've been addressing for uh, a couple of years now, started with an initiative in Governor Cuomo's budget, was about uh, opportunities for experiential learning. I believe this is a, a must for CUNY. It's an area where our students, probably more than most, need the opportunity uh, to be in the workforce in meaningful employment that relates to their area of study that gives them a jump start in the job market. And so we, ha we have a plan that this board has approved, and we have a number of different strategies that we're pursuing uh, right now to provide many more internships and experiential learning opportunities. Chancellor, oh, may I interrupt yeah. for a second? Sure. <clears throat> what, what's the, the, the metric by which you can and, and we can share with you the success or not of what is our plan with regard to internships? I'd be, ha would be happy to provide uh, a synopsis of that from the plan to remind people of what it is. We're doing an inventory now of all of the programs that exist across the university so we can measure what success looks like a little better. They're highly distributed across the, uh, across the system. Right now we're focusing here on a number of opportunities in IT, and finance, and other areas. We tend to expand that, and we intend to build a better mousetrap in the way that we can provide um, access, one-stop shopping to industry sectors, employers, uh, so they aren't going to 24 places to, to find interns. And so uh, there are a couple different ways that we'll do this, but I'll, I'll be happy to follow up on that. Yeah, that would be useful. For those of you who weren't on this committee last year, former trustee Beal raised the point which was accepted by the committee and by uh, Chancellor and uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza, that we would be kept abreast of how the projects that we approve, that we fund, are actually doing, so that we could take stock of whether or not things are working as they were contemplated to work, and if not, make appropriate changes. So thank you very much. Sure. So, so the next step is getting people jobs, launching them on the, in the careers that they need. And this is a parallel, really, to the, to the experiential learning. We believe there's much more we can do uh, to get uh, our graduates into uh, attractive job markets, and that's part of this plan. That's part of the focus. Um, so we believe that uh, CUNY is uniquely positioned, uh, has unparalleled opportunity because of its diversity, its scale, its location, uh, and its position to be a hub of a network of institutions, heck, hence the idea of the connected uh, university. And that's really this point. We can't do it alone. No matter how good the plan is, we can't do it without partnership with government, the public schools, the private sector, um, research institutions, foundations, uh, and community-based uh, organizations. So just to recap, the idea here in this budget, in this master plan, is at core, we need to do a better job of having students be college ready, and for those that aren't, getting them through remediation and into uh, degree uh, granting uh, courses. We need to do a better job of completion in a timely way. And we are going to propose to do that at a pretty dramatic scale, both at community colleges uh, and the senior colleges. And then the third piece of that is we need to do a better job of getting those students, while they're here, into internships and experiential learning opportunities. and when they are leaving into um, successful career opportunities. That's the, there's a lot more to it. It's 120 pages long in the master plan, but that's the essence of it. It's about student success and investing in that and getting people in, through, efficiently, and then to the, the best place possible when they leave. Any questions or comments for the Chancellor? Sure, I think uh, this is a lot of plan to digest. Uh, we got this uh, uh, a few days ago, and, and it's it's a good direction. Um, I know, pers speaking myself personally, I think 
probably need a little more time to chew it over. Um, but some real good stuff in here. And I think it's these are things that will help the university and help guide our discussions about what we ought to be doing as trustees and the future of the university. So I'd hope, Mr. Chairman, it's appropriate to ask for, uh, you know, some degree of um, um, time to shoot us over. Let's just be clear what the it uh, is that you're referencing. The, uh, the master plan uh, to which the chancellor made reference is something that we have reviewed mm -hmm. and have voted upon. Uh, budget request. The budget request. Master. Understood. Any other comments? On the presentation itself or on the budget? On the presentation by the chancellor. We'll have plenty of time to talk about the budget, I promise. Okay. Vice Chancellor Sapienza. Thank you, Trustee Schwartz, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to go through the budget request for fiscal 18 this afternoon. Um, you all have copies of the, you have hard copies at your chairs of the budget request document. It was loaded into SharePoint um, last week, as Trustee Ferrer said. Um, but rather than go through the budget request, the actual document itself, um, we're going to we put together some slides that we'd like to take you through the highlights of the budget request and talk about some of the, the key points um, that underpin the entire request. And um, before we get started on the actual presentation, I just want to, first of all, introduce to all of you who haven't met her, our University Budget Director, Kathy Abada, who's down at the end of the table, and want to recognize Kathy and everyone in the University Budget Office for their terrific work in putting their request together. And also want to thank and recognize uh, University Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz for the great work on the master plan, which, again, was the blueprint for what we put together in terms of the request. Okay, so um, as the Chancellor mentioned, the master plan was the blueprint for this year's request, and that for the first time we've incorporated a multi-year financial plan in the request. You know, there was some discussion about that and some good advice that was given at this committee last month, and so the multi-year financial plan is incorporated in, in this year's request. So the current economic environment is very important to understand um, in terms of evaluating a budget request. And I think as you all are aware, we do have some short-term and long-term financial challenges that, that are ahead of the university. So what are some of those? Well, um, this next slide shows our projected unfunded mandatory needs for the next four years. Um, and so that first item, unfunded cost of current collective bargaining agreements, um, starting next fiscal year in 2018, we have about $68 million of um, our new labor costs that are not yet currently funded that we have to cover. Um, these are costs that will be coming next year, um, and that will increase by $9 million in 2019. The next item, projected new labor costs, even though we have new labor agreements with all of our unions, with the exception of one small one, um, most of those contracts are going to expire over the next year or two. Um, and so these projected new labor costs, just to give you an, a sense of what the costs could be, this represents 2% annual increases. Again, doesn't give any sense as to what those increases will be, because we do follow pattern bargaining from, of the state and the city. But just to give you a sense of what those costs could be with a 2% increase. And then our other mandatory costs, these are things that we have every year, fringe benefits, salary step increments, building rental escalations. Um, and so we do have these costs going out for the next four years that we need to find resources for. Another thing that's really important to understand when evaluating a budget request is what are the economic uh, environments that our funding partners at the state and city are funding. And so these show the estimated um, out-year surpluses or gaps at both the state and city level for, the ne for this year and then the next three years. And this is as reported by the state and the city. And so you see the state um, has some um, gaps for the next couple of years. They're very small, especially considering when you look at post-recession when the state had, was looking at $16 billion deficits. 
um, to have deficits the size of these um, that are very, very small um, compared to those shows the great work that the folks at the state have been doing to, to um, make sure that the state's being fiscally responsible. The city also has out-year gaps. Um, they're a little bit higher than the state's. But again, um, these are gaps that in the past the city has been able to, to manage. And so while there are out-year gaps, both the state and the city um, are in pretty strong fiscal condition, which is a good thing. So in terms of our short and long-term challenges that we're facing here as a university, one thing that I want to make sure that um, you all on the committee understand and, and we have the confidence of is that these short-term and long-term challenges um, are not the result of us being fiscally irresponsible and that we have been putting in place um, changes and, and uh, changes to the way we've been managing um, in terms of our finances. And I really want to deflect all the praise to our college presidents and the way they've managed their budgets. So what this chart shows is the last four years of our state spending. And this, this data comes directly from the state's financial uh, reporting system, the state's accounting system, SFS. And it shows our total spending um, for our senior colleges and system office. And so you can see those totals, and we broke it out by personal service and other than personal service, which is our purchasing budget. And you can see the changes by year. So um, over the three years between fiscal 13 and fiscal 16, our total spending on the state side has gone up by about 5.6%. And when you average that out over three years, the annual average increase has been 1.85%. So even with mandatory costs like fringe benefits, um, salary step increments, building rental escalations, energy costs, even with all these mandatory needs increasing, we have only increased spending on, our, on the state side by 1.85% on average over the last three years. So we have been fiscally responsible. Um, also, in talking about fiscal responsibility, we have um, had an administrative efficiencies program the last two years. In fiscal year 16, between the senior colleges and the central offices, we reduced $51.3 million. We're continuing that this year. The community colleges are also part of our efficiency program this year. We're reducing three of that $36.63 million is coming from the community colleges. So a total of $88 million that we uh, will have reduced when fiscal year 17 is completed. So as the Chancellor said, we have developed a multi-year action plan that will generate the resources that can cover these unfunded mandatory needs and make investments in those key initiatives that we have in the master plan that has been approved. Um, we're going to continue and ramp up our administrative efficiencies plan so that we can redirect resources from administrative areas to core instruction and student support areas. Um, and again, this calls on the help of all of the university stakeholders, the state and the city, um, the university with the administrative efficiencies plan, philanthropy from, from, uh, from the private sector, and of course, tuition increases are included and are very, very critical to the support of this plan. So the, here's a summary of the four-year plan, and this is in the document as well, um, in the, in the um, in the budget request document. And you can see for each year the total sources, um, where they'll be generated from, um, and then what the uses of those resources will be in each year of mandatory cost increases and the master plan of strategic framework initiatives. And I'm going to go through each of these in, in just a couple of minutes. So let's start with what we would invest in. What are those new master plan of strategic framework investments that we will make? Um, and again, there's a lot of narrative in, in the budget rest document, as Trustee Ferrer referenced, um, that talk about what those specific investments will be. So these are just some highlights for you. But uh, the first category is faculty and academic program investment. And this is so critical for us to make sure that we hire, promote, um, recruit, and retain outstanding and diverse faculty. Um, very, very uh, critical for us, one of our top priorities. Um, and that we make sure that those hires are done in areas of demand to both the students and to us serving New York State and New York City. Um, we are also planning to leverage research um, opportunities, create activity and partnerships 
with other universities, organizations, with the private sector. So the research aspect of this is included in this category. Next category is expanding access and improving college preparation. So one of the new programs in here is something called CUNY Connects. And we're very excited about this. This is a program in which CUNY students will be hired to work as peer mentors in the 11th and 12th grade in City Department of Ed high schools. Um, and this will help support college access and the transition process for those high school students. Um, for, the, for the most part, these CUNY students will be placed in the high schools from either which they graduated or the neighborhoods that in which they live. And so we think that this will be a really helpful program in terms of easing that transition from high school in, into college. Um, one of the other pro programs that we're going to be really focusing on is expanding access through online instruction, um, focusing in especially on adult students. Um, that's a key category here. And one other thing that's not on the slide that I want to mention that's part of this uh, category is our single stop centers. We have single stop centers at each of our community colleges, and we have at one at one of our senior colleges, John Jay College. And single stop um, is there to help students get access to the benefits that maybe they are aren't unsure that they can receive, or they're not sure how they go about receiving them. So that could be federal or state or city benefits. And we've had this in place at our community colleges for the last several years. It's been incredibly um, beneficial to our students. Um, we estimate that this has generated um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in additional benefits to our students. So not only helping access, but helping the students with affordability and getting the uh, benefits that they, that they are entitled to. What does this budget contemplate for single stop going forward? Um, so for single stop, to, to expand single stop to all of our campuses that currently don't have it, it would cost about $3.3 million. For this budget for next year, um, that's we, an annual cost. That's an annual cost. Three point three million to expand it to all of the campuses that don't have it. Um, but if we, but this budget for next year, um, it considers a one million dollar um, expansion. So we'd probably, with one million, be able to expand to at least three additional campuses for next year. And just for the benefit of the committee, I, I've been told and shown that single stop. The evidence for single stop is that it's affected 85,000 of our students. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the savings thus far is close to $200 million. Right, $189 million, I believe, was the number that we estimate that the number of the amount of benefits that those 85,000 students have um, received since we've started single stop, $189 million in additional benefits to our students. So this is a proven, successful program. Return on investment, you know, a huge return on investment to our students, no question. It was modeled at CUNY, it is now nationwide. It's the sort of thing that uh, <clears throat> I recognize that there are limited resources and unlimited needs. I recognize that. But this is the sort of program that uh, has proven itself and it translates <coughs> immediately into dollars in the pockets of the families of our students, which is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Hello. Just to, in my previous life at Hostels, we had uh, a single stop, and it was so successful that we were able to connect it with our uh, philanthropic giving to the students. Uh, any student who approached the Hostels College Foundation for a scholarship would require the student to go to single stop first to see if some of the additional aid the student received met that need. And if that was the case, we have more money to distribute for students that didn't qualify. So not only was it a phenomenal instrument in the way that uh, Vice Chancellor Sapiens has described, but we were able to leverage even more to, uh, you know, to provide more support for students. So big believer in the program. I guess the point, though, that you're making is this is we have limited resources to allocate. It seems like with such an obvious ROI that this should be at the front, and we should be finding the full 3.3 million, not mm -hmm. the 1 million. We're certainly asking for it. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. The okay, next category is sharply increasing student graduation rates and improving career preparation. We have a national model for improving graduation rates at the community colleges and in the ASAP program. And we can, we are not only planning on expanding that program, but we could take so many of the elements from that program and have them um, developed at 
at our senior colleges as well, um, things like um, enhancing academic in advisement, um, new technology can play a really key role in academic advisement. It doesn't just mean having uh, advisors physically on the campus. Technology can play a, a very significant role in that. Um, so advisement is, is certainly one core component of this. Um, we also want to sharply expand, as the Chancellor mentioned earlier, uh, opportunities through experiential learning and internships, something that was part of the governor's budget proposal last year. Can we ask questions at this point? Sure. Okay, Absolutely. great. So this is another one of those that has, you know, very high success rate, you know, for the student population. But what, we, what, I, what I don't get here is scale. Mm -hmm. So what is the... What are the number of students affected by this and the number of schools in which it is placed, the campuses that it's placed? Because it has a, you know, um, um, senior vice, executive vice chancellor uh, had given us a report at another meeting and it has some very, uh, really good return on investments and very good outcomes. But what you don't get is what's the scale of this? So. Trustee, so the ASAP program specifically? Yes, AAS, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. I, Thank you. ASAP. Trustee, I believe I can address that. There are 7,000 students university-wide <clears throat> now in ASAP, but we are quickly scaling <clears throat> to 25,000 by fiscal year. I believe it is <clears throat> 2019, 25,000 students, including Bronx Community College, which will become fully a, an ASAP college. We are also scaling this up in four-year pro scaling up. We are piloting the program at a four-year college, which would be a remarkable proof of concept if we could show that the same elements, the enhanced advising, the cohort effect, the taking 15 credits a semester so that credits are accumulated and the students are, are making progress if the metro cards, all of it. If we can <clears throat> show similar success rates, over 50% of associate degree students earn degrees in three years. And we are very much hoping to move the needle on graduation rates at our senior colleges with similar elements. Again, we've just begun the work at the senior college level. So the increases from the beginning of last year was about 4,000 students. Yes. It'll be 25 in a couple more years. And in terms of scale to full population, we chose the Bronx Community College partly because of its size, partly because of the need yes. to be the place where we did the proof of concept for taking it fully ASAP. Okay. Matt, since you're taking questions as we go along, I didn't want to interrupt you earlier, but. Um, the very first item we talked about was faculty and academic program improvements, and we're talking about $14 million next year, 10 for the seniors and 4 for the community colleges. It's really not a lot of money, and mm -hmm. as you made the point before, we brought on a 1,000 new faculty lines, but we're only treading water given how our enrollment has grown. I've asked before, can we <clears> have a discussion, projections, et cetera, in terms of the number of courses that are taught by full-time faculty, yeah. where we think that's going? Sure, uh, we can we can uh, we can give you the data on that in terms of the percentage of instruction taught by full time faculty over the last several years, and you're correct. I mean, um, the, we added a thousand new lines, uh, faculty lines, with the investments that we made from the um, from the tuition increases over the last five years, but because of our enrollment increases, we haven't um, significantly moved to that number of percentage of, of full time faculty. Um, in terms of <clears throat> next year's number, the 14 million that you, that you referenced, um, may not seem like a big number, but when you look at over the four-year plan that we want to, you know, we want to ramp that up each year, um, it, it does get into, I think, a, a significant number. And the thing to keep in mind, too, is, and, and I know you know this from being on the campus, um, it's not, um, it's hard to turn around and, and hire that many new faculty in, in one year because re recruitment has to take place, search committees have to be put together. Um, but having said that, it's certainly one of our top goals is to, is to bring more full time. It was just, uh, you also, just in terms of the trustees who weren't here before, the last master plan had a goal, lofty, 
of 70% of our courses being taught. And in this master plan, we didn't, I mean, we didn't make that number. We didn't come close. And so, but we didn't even put a goal in this master plan. So it is a mm -hmm. concern. I mean, yeah. not just for CUNY, but higher education generally. I want That's, you to finish for sure and sure. take all your questions and comments. But be before we leave ASAP, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, this program has gotten uh, great notoriety around the country, including from the White House, about its success. And other uh, institutions of higher education have adopted it, more or less. It's the sort of thing that makes me wonder, why isn't this uh, just the way single shop, single stop should be a number one priority for us? And why aren't we thinking about more funding for it sooner rather than over a period of time? I would say it's probably the highest priority. I would say my priorities are <coughs> student success, completion, number one. This is probably the highest priority. Yes. It, there's a significant investment that has come into this already that is in the pipeline to get us to the <coughs> 25,000 students. So even just at the community colleges, it's going to take us some time um, with the space needs, the hiring needs, et cetera, to get, we're probably, scaling about as quickly as we could go right now at the community college. It's a pretty rampant rise um, to go 20,000 students over a few years to the program. The senior colleges, as uh, the provost mentioned, just had a first year of a small pilot funded by a, a philanthropy. Um, we think it's intuitive. We think that the same things will work, and the first year's results are very positive. We, we're looking, we, we think now we're going to be able to put in place a second cohort uh, at the same place. This is at John Jay. Um, and so, we, but we want to be on pretty firm ground before we would put forward a request for what is called the ACE program at the senior colleges. So, I, you know, I think that as we have more data on this and results, we'll come back to you for the four-year schools as well as a, as a significant budget request. Thank you. Thank you. Schwartz, I yes. just wanted to um, continue on with what um, Trustee Conway said about this idea of faculty. I know um, the Senior Vice Chancellor mentioned that the goal of this budget is to re retain and hopefully attract more diversity in terms of um, faculty. But I wanted to know, are there percentages or any data that shows um, how we've changed or increased in rank um, and size regarding diverse hiring throughout the university? Yes, we have all of that data, and we can, we'll certainly share it with you. Um, I know City Council has had hearings on this issue um, over the last couple of years, and one as recently as you know, <clears throat> a few months ago. So yeah, we have all that data, and we'll, we'll certainly so share it with question, this committee. Is there any of you can give me a broad idea? Is, has it increased? Has it not increased? Because um, I know this is a conversation we've had before. I just wanted to, an understanding of where we are with our diversity. Uh, trustee, I can, get, I can give you some idea, but <clears throat> not great specifics. Diversity among faculty has increased very slightly, a single percentage point. About one-third of CUNY faculty are faculty of color from underrepresented groups. Now, nationally, that sounds good, because nationally the figure is 19 or 18 percent but it is not good enough for CUNY, where our students are much more diverse right. than, <clears throat> than the student bodies elsewhere. So w the truth is the numbers have been flat over the last few years, but we haven't done as much hiring as we would like to do. Um, with the settling of our contract we ex and, and the aging of our faculty, we believe we will have a chance in the next few years to to not only grow the faculty, which we hope to do, but to um, diversify the faculty with new hires replacing faculty who are retiring. That is, you know, that, that is one of our hopes and goals. I don't understand. Can, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, there's a statistic you just threw out that I didn't yeah. understand. You said 13% of the faculty are people of color, right? Are diverse. No. 30, 33%. About a third, and yes. Yet, and yet, you also said something about it has increased by just a single percentage. A single percent. That's right. So it these are all tenured, long-term employees. <clears throat> Faculty, actually, I, I, trustee, I think they they include tenured and untenured. We're talking about full-time faculty. Full-time faculty. Okay. 
So both tenured and untenured together. And Vita's saying that the, excuse no, me, no, the, the provost the, saying there'll be an opportunity as some of these tenured long-term faculty No, no I, I got change. what you're saying. I, I just, in Spanish we say no cuadra. It doesn't, it just, the, those statistics just don't. If you, if, you separate, <laughs> if you separate out the tenured faculty from the non-tenured, I think what... So the increase the, has been in the non-tenured. It's been in both, mm -hmm. but the tenured faculty, because they were hired quite a long time ago, stretching way back, yes. tend to be more white. They're a whiter, no, no, I, higher I, I percentage. So as, as, as right. the, that, <laughs> that cohort, which is less minority, begins to retire, there will be an opportunity to make some progress. That's right. So we're inching in the right direction. The intention is there and some results. But it's been very, you know, a, a minor increase to be sure. Yeah, yeah. Trustee Bohika. I just want to go back to ASAP for a second, to your point, Chancellor, on the scaling of it. Is there a way to scale it faster? Have the results when we went from 3,000 to 7,000, have we seen the same results? So have yes. they tracked? Yes. So they have. Absolutely. So is there an ability, if we wanted to invest more resources in this program and do a faster scale up, is that, is that a possibility? Because you know, going, we say it's going to go from 7,000 to 25,000, even 25,000 is not, right? It's not there, and that's in a few years, right? Yeah. So can we be more, is there a way to be more aggressive? Can we have a more aggressive plan on this if it, you're getting the results that we, that we say we're getting? Because every year we don't, right? There's that many students that don't have the same opportunity. Right, right. So the, the, the biggest opportunity for growth is with the four years if we can establish, which I, I think will be, mm -hmm. we will be able to do. That'll be the big opportunity. Um, and we probably know a fair amount about that now. With the community colleges, sure, there's one where we have said this is the proof of concept on going completely ASAP, and there are six others, or five others, because Gutman's not an ASAP campus. Um, there are five others where we're growing it significantly, but not at the same rate as the Bronx. Um, you know, we're running into some hiccups in, with the Bronx, I believe, in getting it fully scaled just because of the amount of work and space that's used for it, et cetera, recruiting the students who are eligible for it. But there's no question in my mind that we could increase that rate across CUNY. I, don't, I can't tell you today how quickly we could. I wouldn't want to throw out a number. Okay. Um, you know, we all want to see it increase to all the students that are eligible because of what it does to the graduation rate. The question's about ASAP. Let's continue. And if we're moving to another topic, I'll... I've been I'll, raising my hand. You had, and we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Do you want to talk about ASAP? All, all I want to say is that, adding to what the Chancellor said, you need to consider also that, for example, ASAP is predicated upon the students coming full-time, taking 15 credits. Um, there, there are certain levels of remediation that, right. uh, so that eliminates some students that, that you wouldn't be able to include or we wouldn't know that the success would be the same one that we want. Uh, so that also presents a barrier. But clearly, I think the university is doing the, the responsible of moving as fast as we can uh, and looking at the results to make sure that they're comparable. I, I think you're getting a, a sense of the, this committee at least. Yes. and maybe the board, that these things that work, we really should drive right. them. We should drive them. That's right. Because Tr they make huge differences for our students. They do. And trustee, they also reduce the um, achievement gap between white and Asian students and students of color. They have been phenomenally successful at reducing the gap. The graduation rates are almost identical. Yeah. The other hand that's been up is trustee Clark, and then Cecilia, you will have your floor. I just want to go back to the last um, conversation we had when we had the, the um, staff from enrollment here and we were looking at the budget and why we needed additional money and we came up with a figure about under enrollment of about 3,000 students mm -hmm. and what that tuition deficit would be. Um, so I just wanted to go back to that to figure out um, how do we justify a lot of the um, figures that we have and what is the target for bringing everybody to full enrollment so that we know that we're counting on student on tuition um, to fill the budget um, 
gap that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. Is there a, a concerted effort to make sure that those colleges that have under enrollment mm -hmm. are looking at ways in which to enroll so that everybody's at full enrollment so the tuition that you count um, in the budget um, is there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly those, those plans are in place. Um, for the most part, this budget request and this four-year plan assumes flat enrollment. In the past, um, the university has included in its budget request a component that, said, that included increased enrollments. And, say, and we said the revenue from these increased enrollments will be used to fund these specific things. But because of, of the softness in the enrollment this year, as, as you mentioned, Trustee Clark, um, we, we are not building in, certainly not building in enrollment increases, but we are assuming that with the work that we're going to be able to do with our campuses, that we'll be able to keep enrollment at least flat. Um, but if colleges are successful in bringing more students, that will be additional revenue to those campuses that they'll be able to keep and make for, for local investments. Cecilia. What is the dollar amount that you are going to spend going forward on increasing and retaining faculty of color? Um, we don't have a specific amount for that, um, but uh, we certainly could develop um, you know, that number. Um, we have a, a number for increasing faculty, um, and that, as I said earlier, certainly includes um, uh, being a more diverse workforce, um, but we don't have a specific ask in terms of, of that. What is the project that will be funded out of the money that is going to this general pot? Because I, I understand Rabinu, uh, Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz's um, mm -hmm. point about this idea that faculty is going to, you know, retire, and that's how we're covering the gap in di the diversity. Mm -hmm. um, but. I, I'd like a specific pro project or program that goes along with that, that doesn't, isn't contingent upon people dying. No, no. <laughs> Can I rephrase the question <laughs> by, by reference to the budget? The, the budget has a line item under the Master Plan Strategic Framework Initiatives of faculty and academic program investment of $14 million. Is any portion of that $14 million devoted to uh, increasing diversity? Yes. Um, I, I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but we, we can get you the, the details in terms of what makes up that $14 million. But then the answer to your question is if it's a piece of $14 million, it's a small number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, I would l like to try to address your question. We have absolutely been thinking about how we can proactively mm -hmm. diversify our fact faculty. It includes, among other things, hiring many of the wonderful doctoral students. We, we have a diverse <clears throat> doctoral student uh, population. And we would like to, you know, grow our own faculty to some degree, not entirely and not exclusively. But we have been thinking about leadership programs to advance young faculty of color into leadership positions and, um, and you know, to, uh, we, ha we already have programs focused on um, uh, uh, advancing their careers, promotion and tenure. But again, we, we certainly have thought about ideas. Again, while CUNY faculty are much more diverse than the national average, that's not good enough. We need to be proactive and we are the, you know, we, we do have some ideas. I don't know how much of our money is budgeted for those ideas at this time, but we are, we are committed to diversifying our faculty. By the way, each college has their own diversity plan. I know Trustee for our committee is going to be looking at these with regard to faculty true. today. Right. I think Later we have them for non-faculty. Right. You're invited. Um, <clears throat> Trustee Clark. Yeah, I was. Um, I, I wanted to say most organizations, when they are committed to diversity, have a chief diversity officer or a person um, dedicated to making sure that the talent that they're looking for, right. the qualification of the person in terms of that diversity, is there. And in, as much as you may not want to hire somebody, I'm sure there must be an individual already in CUNY that we could identify and make into that chief diversity officer. There is. And there is an officer. There is. Yeah. Dr. Arlene Torres. So we'll be at, uh, I think, trustee for our committee. Probably. Indeed. We are having a full presentation 
on okay. utilization at every level in every CUNY institution, including CUNY Central. Okay. So and it's going to be, we're going to be there a while. No, okay. Each campus okay. has a chief diversity officer too. Mm -hmm. Each campus has a chief diversity officer that certifies that the pools in every higher staff and faculty are diverse to begin with. But may I request that we hold the questions for just a few minutes mm -hmm. and let Matt finish this presentation yeah, sure. and then we can okay. ask, ask away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. And then the, the last master plan uh, area is preparing CUNY students for the global marketplace, um, which includes the uh, infusion of global competencies, developing scholarships, um, funds for study abroad opportunities for our high need students, and also bringing more international students into our CUNY campuses. One other item that we want to focus on that's part of our master planning uh, investments, and this is something that we have developed recently, so it's not included in the master plan that the trustees voted on last week, but this is a new program to uh, a student affordability initiative that we're calling Bridge to Completion. So uh, New York State's TAP program is certainly one of the best financial aid programs that any state has in the country. Um, but one of the limitations in TAP is that it's only for eight semesters. And because our students um, have large work, family obligations, it's hard for them to complete their degrees in eight semesters. And, es and especially a lot of our students who articulate from the community colleges and maybe spend six semesters at a community college and then go to a senior college, now they only have two semesters of eligibility left to get their bachelor's degree. Um, so this is a problem for thousands of our students. And so what this Bridge to Completion initiative would do is to say all of those students who are in good academic and financial standing and who have lost their TAP eligibility but are within 30 credits of graduation, that the university would provide financial support for up to two semesters to help those students get to completion. Um, so we think that this is a, an affordability initiative. We think it's a completion initiative. Um, we think that it's going to benefit thousands of students, and we're really hopeful that um, our budget will have enough resources that we can, we can fund this. And that's the $17.5 million? That's the $17.5 million item, yes. Okay. Okay, so we talked about all the investments that we would make in, in new initiatives um, in both faculty and, and, and student success initiatives, but we also have our mandatory cost increases. And this chart shows a summary of those mandatory costs for next year at our senior colleges and our community colleges. There's three major components, building rentals, contractual salary increments, and fringe benefits. Um, building rentals are mostly new escalation costs at the uh, facilities that we do lease. Contractual salary increments are um, our faculty as part of their contract move up steps every year, salary steps, and these are the costs of those increments. And the last is fringe benefits, which is by far the largest. Um, and the, the two biggest drivers in terms of annual cost increases here, and we're not any different than any other governmental entity, are health insurance and pension liabilities. Um, and so we're projecting at the senior colleges that that'll be an additional $36 million for next year. Total mandatory cost increases for next year, $55 million. So we talked about what we would invest in. We talked about the mandatory needs that we have to cover. And so how are we proposing to fund these things? There's five major areas that we're proposing on, on how we would generate resources to fund these uh, projected costs and these investments. One is a state base aid increase for our community colleges. Second is additional New York City support for the senior colleges, including a phase in of the TAP tu tuition credit restoration. Third is the funding of mandatory needs from the state and city. Um, we're asking the state and city to cover 100% of our mandatory needs increases. Fourth is what we are going to do internally in terms of administrative efficiencies. And fifth is the uh, extension and modification of the predictable tuition policy. So I'm going to talk about each of these um, for a couple of minutes. So community college base aid increase, we're requesting a three-year community college funding commitment of $250 per student FTE each year. We asked for this last year. Um, SUNY asked for, had a very similar request um, last year as well. 
Um, our current base aid level is slightly under $2,700 per student FTE. Um, and it's gone up in each of the last four years, which we're very grateful for that the state has stepped up and increased it. But when you compare that level to where we were in 2009, and you take the 2009 level and add inflation, we're actually down about $382 per student FTE on a community college base aid. And that's because uh, post-recession, we had four straight years where the community college base aid number went down. So the last four years, we've caught up in, in nominal dollars, but not in terms of when you look at the purchasing power and you add on inflation. So we're asking for a three-year commitment of $250 per FTE in order to support our community college operation and provide support for uh, strategic investments. Next, um, and this is something that we're asked, this first time we're asking for this in our budget request, and that is additional New York City support for our senior colleges. For the past 20 plus years, New York City has provided $32.3 million for support of our senior colleges and central administration. Um, that number has not changed. It's been flat at $32 million for over 20 years. Um, when you apply the higher education price index to that number, um, to, in today's dollars, had that number moved every year, it would be closer to $60 million. So we're asking that the city increase their share of funding for the senior colleges from $32.3 million to $60.3 million. We're also asking, um, because of the importance of our senior colleges in terms of the city's economic health, and providing opportunities to, to the citizens of New York City, requesting an additional $20 million for senior college operating support. And lastly, we're asking the city to, to help us cover the gap um, on terms of TAP waiver credits. So we are legally bound to covering the difference between our senior college tuition and the maximum TAP award. Maximum TAP award currently is $5,165 per student. Our senior college tuition for a full-time resident student is $6,330. Covering that gap costs us $51 million. That's $51 million that has to come off the top of our budget, and that's $51 million that's not available to our senior colleges to make investments in their students and in their academic programs. And so we're asking the city um, to put up some funding this year to help us phase in um, the closing of that gap. So that's $10 million. So in total, we're asking for $58 million in additional support from the city for the senior colleges for next year. But, but is that right? In the past, we've asked the city for $32 million? $32 million has been the base budget for the senior colleges that the city has funded. It's always been $32 million. Um, we have never asked for an increase to that number but we feel that certainly the equity argument um, in terms of that, that number has never moved. Um, so we proposed that, this year to move it from 32 to 58. 30, 30, no, 32 to 90. To 90. By 58 million, correct. Okay. And the 58 is 48 for the uh, senior colleges and 10 for this phase in of uh, the correct tap, uh, the tap restoration. The tap gap. Correct. The tap gap. Mm -hmm. Do we, can, can I ask a question? Please. Do we know, the number hasn't changed in 20 years, do we know what state aid has gone up by and TAP has gone up by in that same 20 years? Yeah, um, and again, I, I don't have that number available, but we certainly have funding history tables going back to, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the mid-80s. Um, and the TAP number, um, I think we can get through, through uh, higher Education Service Corporation. So, so yeah, we can provide the, the committee with that, with that data. Next item is our Administrative Efficiencies Program. And as I said earlier, we, be, we are going to expand on the Administrative Efficiency Program we began last year. Um, as you all know, we've engaged with an outside um, organizational expert, McKinsey and Company, to, to build on this. They've begun their work, um, and we're really looking forward to uh, getting their final product in a few months. Um, and the focus there is going to be um, business process redesign, um, strategic sourcing, um, improving um, services to our campuses 
revenue enhancement opportunities and finding efficiencies in facilities management. So again, very excited about this and we're looking forward to, to the work that they're going to do. Matt, on this, given what we're paying McKinsey, what's the expectation for what they'll find for us in terms of cost efficiencies? Mm -hmm. We have not given McKinsey a target in terms of saying we want you to save X millions of dollars. Um, and part of the motivation in doing that is we really want them to focus on business process redesign and improving services to our campuses, improving those synergies between the campuses and the central office, between the campuses and the shared service centers and shared service activities that the central office provides. Um, and improving business process throughout the campuses in the central office. So um, we haven't given them a target to say you must reach this number of, of millions of dollars of savings, but we certainly expect that um, the number is going to be a significant number that's going to help us um, with our efficiency program. So let me say two uh, quick things about that. One is, you know from this document that we came up with a number of $75 million over this period of efficiency, so that's sort of the... Uh, the straw man, we're starting with them. We want you to test this. I mean, that's our, we developed that uh, internally. Uh, we think it's realistic. Um, we'd love it if they do uh, better than that. But what they're going right through right now is a benchmarking and trying to identify specific opportunities. But that's our starting place uh, for them. Um, and to be clear, second, Chancellor, that's 75 is over four years, yeah, correct? correct? Yeah, so the, the second point is that when they identify these opportunities and we bring it back to you to discuss these, um, then we'll talk about how we do the implementation. And there are a number of ways we can do that with them, okay. without them, have them do it. If they do it, they'll, um, you know, the, whatever they're paid will come out of, of savings. Uh, you know, my personal bias is that I want to do it in partnership because I want to build a culture with our people doing a good part of the work on implementation. So I think we'll have uh, some savings there, but have their guidance and implementation. Okay, next category, predictable tuition policy. So I know we're going to need a few minutes to discuss this. And so I first want to start off with giving some background into the predictable tuition policy that was passed um, in 2011 by, by the governor and the legislature. And so in 2011, that predictable tuition policy was for up to $300 a year for five years. And those are the increases that the university implemented. And over that time, um, we used the tuition to invest an additional $263 million in our campuses. Programmatic investments, These, this $263 million did not go to, to cover shortfalls or to cover mandatory needs. These were new investments that were made in our campuses, $183 million at the senior colleges, $80 million at the community colleges. Of that $263 million, $75 million was provided in additional financial aid, $73 million went to invest in full-time faculty, and as we said earlier, about 1,000 new faculty lines were added over that time. So. Our campuses made terrific investments with the additional tuition revenue that was generated. So what was the return that we received on those investments? Well, in looking at the outcomes and looking at all of the data that one would evaluate higher education institutions on, they're all trending in a very positive direction over, over that time period. Graduation rates for our baccalaureate freshmen have increased for both the four-year rate and the six-year rate. Same for the associate freshmen. Um, the graduation rates have increased. We've granted 22% 22, 22 more degrees in, in academic year 14-15 than we did six years earlier. So, so that's trending in the right direction. When the predictable tuition policy was implemented in 2011, folks said CUNY's going to lose enrollment because tuition is going up. The opposite happened. We added 13,000 new students, almost a full campus when you think about it, 13,000 new students from 2010 to 2015. Academic momentum for baccalaureate students in terms of measuring how many credits they earn in their freshman year, that's a key indicator of student success. That went up. And the last one there I think is, is tremendous, that the transfer rate for associate graduates, students that graduated from community colleges or from other associate degree programs, and then articulated into baccalaureate programs went from 60.7% to 74.4% over the last six years. So 
not only did we make good investments with the tuition money, but we quickly saw that the data that we would measure success by have all been moving in, in, the, in a positive direction. So good return on investment from, from those tuition revenues. You know I have questions about this, so I'm just going to ask them and then you can answer them. Um, what Are you done with the tuition? No. Let oh. me finish on tuition and then please ask. Thank you. So this next slide on, on, on page 22 um, is something that I think is so critically important to understand why we need a predictable tuition policy here at the university and, and in New York State. <coughs> so this is a history of senior college tuition over the last 30 years, 1987 to 2016. The red bars indicate um, how state aid has changed at our senior colleges on an annual basis. <clears throat> the blue bars indicate how much tuition has increased at our senior colleges in each year. So I want to call your attention <clears throat> to the time period of 1991 to 2010, 20 years, a 20-year look at senior college tuition and state aid. So in those 20 years, senior college tuition increased only six times in, in 20 years, which I think one would look at that and say, that's pretty good. It only increased six out of 20 years. But look at the percentage increases that happened in those six years. Five out of those six years, tuition increased by more than 10% in that year. And in three of those years, tuition increased by more than 30%. I mean, look at 1996, it increased by 32%. A 32% increase for this year would be an increase of $2,100 in, in one year. So the tuition increases were unpredictable, and they were rather large because they were taking place um, sporadically and not annual modest increases. So that was one problem. The other problem is when you look at the red bars, in every single one of those six years that tuition went up, state aid to the senior colleges went down, which meant that every single dollar of the tuition revenue that was generated in those years went to cover budget shortfalls. Now, one dollar went for new investments in our campuses and new investments in our students. Um, so this was the wrong policy to have in place, and 20 years was, uh, was utilized under this policy. Under this policy. So 2011 comes along, the governor and the legislature passed the predictable tuition policy. And so now look at the right-hand side of the chart and look at those bars. So 2012, you have to discount because the agreement took place in summer 2011 and the state budget was already adopted for 2012. And again, we were still coming out of the recession and so state aid went down. But from 13, 14, 15, 16, four years in a row, tuition, yes, at the senior colleges did increase, but it increased by very modest amounts, well below 10% each year. And in each year, state aid went up. So as we looked at just a few slides ago, we were able to take that tuition revenue and use it for investment in our campuses rather than to fill budget shortfalls. That's why the predictable tuition policy works, and that's why we're supporting an extension of the predictable tuition policy. And just for comparison purposes, to look at what our, uh, on the next slide, what our current tuition is at the senior colleges, it's $6,330 here, as I mentioned earlier. We're a tick below SUNY. Um, but if you look at the private colleges here in New York City, we are well below the private colleges. We're still extremely affordable. And if you would add fees onto this chart, our average fees for a SUNY student at a senior college is between three and $400 a student. At the private colleges, it's well over $1,000 per student. So the disparity grows significantly when you add on fees to this. So we, even with the five years of increases, we're still incredibly affordable. So what are we recommending in terms of extending the, the predictable tuition policy? Um, we're recommending a more modest tuition plan um, through 2021. So instead of a five-year uh, extension, we are recommending a four-year extension, so that will be consistent with our four-year master plan. In terms of the increases, we're recommending a reduced amount. Instead of $300 a year, we're recommending $250 a year, again, to try to be sensitive to those affordability and access issues. And that's for the senior colleges. For the community colleges, we're recommending, again, four-year uh, increases, but at one, capped at $100 per year. And what 
we are prepared to do if our funding requests from the state and city are met for community colleges for next year, we will commit to freezing community college tuition next year for a second straight year similar to, to what we did this year. Um, so again, we're trying to be responsive to, um, to the needs and trying to modify the predictable tuition policy um, that was passed in, in 2011. And just again, to give you some data and to make sure that the, you have all the information um, at your fingertips in terms of evaluating this policy, please keep in mind that more than two thirds of our full-time undergraduates currently attend tuition free because of the TAP program and because of Pell Grants from the federal government. Eight in 10 graduate debt free, which is incredible when you think about what happens throughout the country um, in terms of, of the debt uh, issue that's been, been talked about uh, for the last several years. And in terms of Pell and TAP, um, in last academic year, we administered almost $600 million in Pell grants, um, over 144,000 recipients, and over $300 million in, in TAP awards, 106,000 recipients. Um, and so I, I want to show you this chart. And we talked about this chart at our last fiscal committee meeting, and, and um, this was requested. And we wanted to make sure that, again, you understand um, the major components of the CUNY's funding sources. So the left-hand side shows our three major funding sources, state aid, city support, and how much is generated from students. And so at, at a very macro level, it's 45% state, 44% from tuition, and 11% from the city. But when you dive down into that tuition number, 27% um, is, is really the amount that's coming from students because TAP and Pell cover about 17%. And then the other thing to keep in mind is because TAP is 10%, the state aid number that's supporting the university goes up from 45% to 55% because of their support for the TAP program. On the right-hand side, it's those same numbers, but we are showing it by student uh, full-time equivalent. So our total funding per student FTE is $16,240. Um, state aid is $72.88. City support is $17.47. And students is $72.04. But again, when you look at how much of that is from TAP and Pell, coming from the students is really $4,468 per student. And that doesn't include all of the other scholarship opportunities that students may have. This is just discounting it for TAP and Pell. Um, so other scholarships that you, the colleges might have given out, college foundations, that would reduce that number even more. And again, in looking at state aid, if you add in the TAP number to the state aid number, the state aid number is closer to $8,800 per student. So again, want to make sure that, that that's clear um, in terms of our funding sources. Matt, th this, this chart is very helpful. Uh, you gave us in November a chart that showed us 2015. Right. And then this one is 2017. Do you have this for 2018, your proposed budget? Um, yes. Um, we, we have that, and we can, we can share that with you. Um, I'm, yeah, no, we didn't, have, we didn't put it in the document. But we have that, and we can, we can share that with you. But let me jump to the next slide, okay. because um, you'll get a sense of, of those funding shares. And, um, I know just when you look at tuition, tuition in 15 was 31 percent, tuition in 17 is 27 percent. Right. I don't know what right. 18 looks like. But right. And no, no, that's right. And it's a great point. And it's, and it's because there were no tuition increases in 16. Um, and there were state aid and city support increases. And so that percent went down. So this chart on, on slide 27 is also in the budget request document. And it's, just, and it's a summary of just fiscal 18 in terms of um, the funding requests that we have um, for each of the categories and what those would go to fund. And so you can see the total proposed percentage changes from the state we're asking for initial 4.4%. The city would go up by 24.3%, but um, if you look at that second line there, previous funding commitments, $23.4 million has already been committed by the city for the expansion of ASAP that we talked about earlier and additional fringe benefit costs. So when you take that out, essentially the city number goes down to 16.6% increase. And then from tuition is 2.3%. Um, so tuition would go up by the, by the smallest amount um, in this request. State and city support would go up by, by more. And then the last thing I just want to point out about this chart is that bottom 
uh, row. Um, we would fund $200 million in additional needs. State, city, and tuition would generate $186 million. That gap of $14 million, we would generate from the Administrative Efficiencies Program the year one of the four-year plan that would generate $75 million over the four years. We, would, we are committing to coming up with $14 million uh, in resources to cover the entire plan. Um, so next steps, um, once the budget request is approved by, by the committee and by the full board, um, it will then be shared publicly. And um, it's important for us to get this out um, as quickly as possible because the state executive budget will be issued in January 2017. City preliminary budget for 2018 will also be issued in the same month. And we want to make sure that our funding partners at the same city know what our uh, funding needs are, and we have time to walk them through it and, and fully explain it. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate you considering you know, decreasing tuition, um, but what other alternatives have been explored besides raising tuition? Um, and you specifically talked about possibly freezing um, community Mini college, college tuition. Mm -hmm. What about is there a plan in place for senior colleges if they are also funded? That would be the first question that I have. Um, I also wanted to bring up that this year there was no increase in tuition. So what if there happens to be, for whatever reason, no tuition increase in the coming year or coming years? What's the plan there? Is there a contingency plan? Mm -hmm. And then finally, the question that we have is, would you be able to separate from the budget the idea of increasing tuition, because as students, both on, at the DSC um, and, also, and the USS, have supported tuition freezes through resolutions, through different mm -hmm. actions. Right. Um, and so obviously, we're against the tuition increase itself, not the operating budget. So. Mm -hmm. No, and thank you, Cecilia. And you know, I just want to, to reassure the whole committee, and, and especially the the, the student reps that are here in the entire University Student Senate that we take tuition increases extremely seriously here at the university. Um, and we know your position on it, and, and we appreciate the dialogue that we've had with you all over the last several years about it. Um, in terms of what the implication would be if we don't have a tuition increase, you know, we've been very clear for the last two years um, when we really started um, serious negotiations with our unions on a new contract that um, we have three main funding sources here in the university, state, city, and tuition, and that tuition revenue was going to have to be a component that was going to be needed to, to fund these increases, um, the salary increases. Um, and we think that that's one of the best investments that we can make with, with the student dollars is recruiting and retaining great faculty. That's, that's something that um, you feel the direct benefit of as students. Um, and so, as we saw earlier, we do have costs that are going to grow next year by $68 million for our faculty contracts. Um, it's really critical that we generate the resources to, to cover that. Um, and so, if there's no tuition increase next year, um, we will not have this sufficient resources that we're counting on to, to cover those costs. And we'll have to cover them in other ways that, that um, you know, will be harmful to our campuses. Um, so that's in terms of implications. In terms of community colleges and, and senior colleges, um, you know, we want to be mindful of the um, community college um, tuition rate, $4,800 this year um, at our, for a full-time <coughs> resident student. Um, we saw the chart before about the senior colleges, and that, they're at 6330 and when you compare that, um, Certainly, the private sector were much lower. But even when you look at public higher ed institutions throughout the country, senior colleges were very low. Community colleges, though, when you look at community colleges throughout the country, not so much. $4,800 is not on the low side. Now, some of that has to do that we're in New York City, and, and the cost of doing business here is higher. But we want to be mindful of that, of not increase community college um, tuition that much uh, to the same rates as senior colleges. We want to be mindful that, for the most part, community college students um, have greater financial need than senior college students. 
Um, and lastly, we have to keep our eye on that the maximum TAP award is $5,165, and we want to try to keep community college tuition within that envelope. Um, so those are the, the kind of differences between community colleges and senior colleges. Um, so, you know, we're not contemplating um, a freeze at the senior colleges, um, but if we do receive the funding that we're requesting for the community colleges, we would commit to freezing it for at least next year at the community colleges. Chairperson Schwartz, yes. I think um, one last question Cecilia asks is about the separation, um, separating the budget from the tuition free. So if you can speak to that point yeah. before I ask my question. Um, you know, I, I would um, be very um, careful about, about that piece, and I would strongly recommend against doing that. I mean, you saw the, the funding chart, and I'll, I'll just jump back to it so everyone has it in front of them. Well, the only way you could do it if you separate it was to put in a request to make up for the, the loss in, in tuition. And so <coughs> the size of the request would go up dramatically if you, if you separated tuition out and still had to. We have to fund the faculty salary contracts and staff. Right. Trustee Buddy. <coughs> so first I want to thank you for a sound proposal. And the tuition chart was very helpful, this showing the comparison, so you can see kind of where we are, relatively speaking. The, the new initiatives that we have here, we have the initiatives that were in the master plan and the funding numbers associated with them here, I think seeing them for the first time, exactly how much they cost. There are probably other initiatives that we might want to consider in addition to those or reevaluate kind of how much we want to spend on those initiatives. But I also view the, the issue of tuition as it, as it comes up we should look at what the impacts are if there is no tuition to the point. One option is additional funding requests. Another option is other things that you'd have to do at the university level to make up for that, right, in the event that that did not happen. So we should have those so we understand what the impacts would be. Also, on the organizational consultant that we're using, that also I view that as an opportunity two ways and maybe expand kind of what they're looking at, which is, if they can identify savings, then that's opportunities for us to make additional investments in some of the chancellor's priorities and other things, right? If they identify more savings, then we can use that to reinvest in the system. So I would hope that we could use them to, kind of, to look at that mm -hmm. as well. So I think that, and then the tuition also, to the extent that there is something there, that also allows us to make more investments. So to the extent we have to choose amongst priorities, investing in more money, perhaps in the ASAP program or perhaps in some of the other programs. So it's one pie, but if we have some of the resources from different places, we can then use them to invest in a lot of the places where the board may think and the master plan may think we should put more investments in. So I think we should look at all that and then get a better perspective of kind of where we want to make the investments, and particularly in the, in the new initiatives. I think there are probably some, some more things that we might be able to do. Other comments or questions? Yes. I am very concerned about this idea that we need tuition increases in order to fund salary increases, and that mm -hmm. high is incre incredibly problematic um, because that's essentially using, you know, student funds or money from our pockets to grow the faculty. Um, so, could you speak a little bit more about that? Like sure. why it's why it's tied into specifically that. Well, uh, you know, as I said earlier, um, we've been very clear, transparent, public about the fact that um, we were going to need to have tuition increases in order to help fund these contracts. But again, when you look at the funding um, slices here, um, students are already paying for faculty salaries. Faculty salaries are eighty percent of what our total, uh, well, full-time um, salaries are 80% of what our total expenditure are. The overwhelming majority of, of that 80% are faculty salaries. And so um, because 44% of our total budget comes from students, students are already paying for faculty salaries currently. Um, and all of those additional faculty that we hired over the last five years, all those additional lines that were created came from, um, fr directly from tu additional tuition revenue. So, we think it's it's extremely appropriate um, for tuition revenue as one of the as the second largest component of our 
total operating budget to be used for the largest component of our expenditure base. Um, and, and as I said earlier, I, I also want to underscore the fact that um, this contract, by being able to pay our faculty um, at a higher rate, is going to help us recruit um, new faculty, uh, more talented faculty, and retain the, the, the current talented faculty that we have. So um, that's going to be a direct benefit to, to the students. I'm going to just, just on this chart, because I always ask for it to be presented a little differently, um, just for presentation purposes. Sure. It comes from one source. We put it in two different buckets, right? So right. just for presentation, it's actually 55%, not right, not 45% from the state. Correct. Right? Because we count tax. So cat, if we can show it in the yep. future as either other state aid, state aid, but the state aid is actually 55%. Correct. Compared to the 44. And the same thing on the other side, when you use the numbers, you're looking at about $8,800 in state aid. Correct. Versus the other. So just in presentation, yeah. I think we it's can, important to kind of just show that. Because you also show how that number has increased over time, because the TAP number does not go down. That right. consistently goes up every year. So, yeah. 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 Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> So I do want to um, thank you. You did present this to us last week. Thank you for always sitting down with us and um, reviewing this. This idea of the bridge to completion program is great. I think it's something that USS and NYPIRG and other student organizations have advocated for years um, to help that find um, tap increase and meet um, where tuition is. So that's something I think will be worth every penny and that we can actually partner on. Great. Um, but I do go back to the point um, that Cecilia brings up, um, this idea that we just came through a year where we requested tuition increase and we did not receive it, right? Mm -hmm. So we sit here and we say, we're gonna multi-plan, we're gonna put tuition in there, and we're gonna hope that it comes out, and then what if we go through a year that we just went through again? What, what do we do? Do we come back and say, okay, great, let's try this again next year? So this idea that we're asking for the separation is, again, as she says, we support the operation. We understand that this university sure. needs to operate, we need to go to classes, we need to attain a degree. Um, but this idea about the faculty contract, it's something that we've heard before. I've heard the narrative before that, you know, we're gonna use this money, we're gonna bring diverse people in. We're, look, we've heard this narrative before and we haven't yet seen it there. Um, so that's my idea of us not planning to fail. Um, so tuition is, for us, it's, I think it's unacceptable. The, the idea is that enrollment increased over the years that tuition went up, and then now we see enrollment going down. It doesn't, you know, I don't think that that's an actual, you know, rationale. And based on the chart that you did show, um, state aid did not go up every year as tuition went up, actually, in 2012, from the chart that you showed, it actually went down. Um, and then I guess my final question is also, who comes up with this number of 250? Like, do we just sit in a room and say, Hey, three hundred dollars sounds good. Let's just throw it on the table. Why not fifty dollars? Why not? You know, where do we come up with these numbers to say this is what we want tuition to be? Um, and so I go back to the point that you made, that she brings up. There's a contingency plan in place for community colleges where it's we can either re um, receive the full funding, or it will be a hundred dollars, which sounds like again it's something that we can work towards because there's advocacy work that can be done to that. Mm -hmm. But we just we're giving up. We're conceding that state the state and the city can't fund our public university. So it's saying, now we're not even gonna ask for there to be a freeze in the senior college. We're not even gonna touch that avenue. And I think that that's something we've turned our backs on, that this is a public university. And I think we should, we're going away from the conversation of state and city investments. I think we should um, continue to come back towards it. So I guess that is my question again. In terms of the funding for the senior colleges, why we're not considering a freeze? Because again, if we can receive full funding, then there will be no need to raise tuition. And then this idea that the uh, tuition raise will be used for faculty contracts directly is something that we heard before but did not see. So what is the guarantee that this time it will actually? But, uh, just first of all, the last point, it is being uh, tuition from last year, 100% of it is being used for the faculty contracts. Okay. Hasn't been used yet. It's being used as they're implemented. So that's in a that's in a box that's being used for that purpose and a significant portion of the year before in the same place. Mm -hmm. So we're using those two years tuition <laughs> as part of this plan to finance uh, the new contracts going forward. Okay. You know, it's not just the, the, the going forward piece <clears throat> of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to hit that yeah. one. And just one point of clarification, uh, you know, small point is, because you mentioned 2012, which is a good point on the chart. Um, it does show that state aid went down that year. But just want to point out that when the predictable tuition policy was enacted in the summer of 2011, the state budget for fiscal year 2012 had already been adopted and had a decrease for that year. Um, 
again, because we were coming out of the recession. But, but since the policy was technically in place in 2011, so the first year was really fiscal year 13. And from that point on, state aid did increase. Um, but, but just to go back to your, to your point, and, and again, totally hear you and, and, and appreciate, you know, the, the thought and the, um, and, um, you know, that you've given and the ideas that you, you have, you and your leadership team have given us. Um, you, know, you saw at the beginning of the presentation that the costs that we have, the mandatory needs that we have to cover. Um, tuition is such a large component of the budget. And again, just to go back to this chart that I have up here on the screen in terms of the history, we really don't want to go back to that place where um, right now the state and city are both in, in a strong economic position, but we don't want to leave ourselves exposed to the place where if things uh, go the other way and we have to do a very large tuition increase in any one year. Um, so we think the predictable tuition policy provides um, students and their families with uh, the ability to plan and the ability to keep the uh, university affordable. So, we, yes, sir. A different voice and, and sort of piggybacking on the point that Matt said about the ability to plan. And, and I just want to share a story about uh, how the predictable tuition policy played a role in my previous institution at Ostos. Uh, where I had the five years that sort of coincided with the plan. Um, one of the main things when Alstos was nominated to compete for the Aspen Prize, which is the highest prize given to a community college in the country, a million dollars, you competed. We ended up in the top ten. The one program that they signaled as transforming, helping to transform Alstos was the Student Success Coach Program. That program existed exclusively because of the rational tuition policy. When I came in, uh, we knew and we copied some of the things from ASAP about counseling, but we couldn't make the investments because I couldn't know year to year how much additional money I was <clears throat> going to receive. I couldn't commit to hiring the kind of counselors that I wanted for the students there because we had a five-year plan and I had a sense of at least, you know, I mean, it depended on enrollment, some of the funding coming in, I could go to the university and say, I want to make this investment so that every student that comes to Walstos has assigned one advisor, which we didn't do before, right? And that program, which I think was transformational, and, and not my opinion, the Aspen people, <clears throat> you know, we were not invited to be competing for the prize before, and after that, we were in the top 10. I can point out to that uh, planning capacity that the tuition um, increase gave me to be able to make a direct investment that I think had a dramatic impact on the life of, of students. So I know that, that this is an unpopular topic, uh, but I also want to put the perspective of the presidents in terms of our capacity to plan, to invest, and, and to do the right thing for our students and our faculty when we have that kind of long range uh, component of, of some sense of investment and, and give a concrete example of something that I think was very transformational in, in my previous role and something that I don't have now looking into the future as the president of Queens. So the only thing I'll say to the two of you that I'd like to talk to the committee for a moment about next steps. Um, <clears throat> as you heard from um, Vice Chancellor Sapienza, we have three principal sources of revenue to satisfy our operating needs. That's the city and the state, mostly the city, and tuition. And tuition has been part of our sources of revenue for a long time. New York is in the forefront of states in our country in supporting public higher education. And for that, we should all be grateful, and I, I know you are. Uh, it's a long-term question for our country to ultimately come to resolve. But we have a shorter-term problem, which is keeping the lights on here for this year and for next year, which is what this budget's all about and which we'll, why we have to confront it. Uh, let me just say, I, I thought that the budget presentation that was sent to this committee, uh, albeit without enough time to, to review it as we all would like to, was very good, and I thought your presentation today was enormously helpful. Uh, I can assure you that everybody on this committee reads what you send out. Um, and I would urge you that if there's going to be a PowerPoint, like this very good PowerPoint, that we get it in advance because we will have read it. 
and we could short circuit some of the discussion here because we have already formulated our questions. Uh, having said that, I'm very mindful of the last page of your presentation about next steps. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a situation in our state where the executive budget uh, is dealt with in January of 2017. It's now October of 16. We have a board meeting scheduled for the 26th of October, and the next one is in January. Right. Yes. And after the state of the budget, after the state of the state, rather. I'm sorry, Chairs. Yeah. I just want to point out, and we have a public hearing on October. the 9th, October 19th. We will have further input from interested people in what is our budget, because the budget has been available for all to see mm -hmm. since it was made available to us to see. So the question is, we have a resolution in front of us, a resolution that. Uh, calls for this committee to endorse uh, this budget. There have been a number of questions that people have raised. There's been a request for further consideration, um, <clears throat> and we've had lots of answers to some of these questions. It, it seems to me we can do one of a number of things. Uh, if people are satisfied, and I would like to see unanimity on this, frankly, uh, we could endorse this resolution and present it to the board for further discussion. Uh, if we're not there, we could pass on this resolution without adopting it as a committee, and we could let this budget be discussed in full at the board meeting for an acceptance or not at the October 26th board meeting. If our board doesn't accept it then, we're going to have to schedule, and I assume we can schedule, a special meeting of our board, and we could schedule a special meeting of this committee with notice and opportunity for others to be heard. Uh, before we say yay or nay to this budget. Uh, so those are the options we have, it seems to me. Maybe there's others that I'm missing. And uh, we should talk about how we want to proceed as a committee. Yeah. Trustee Mojica. I would just like more time just to go to review mm -hmm. before we can actually endorse it and send it sure. to the committee. Because there were a lot of questions here mm -hmm. that I thought were, were something that we probably yeah. should follow up on. So um, more time would be, would be better. Do you like the idea of meeting and conferring separately again and having a special board meeting to deal with the budget? Or do we simply present this to the board, mm -hmm. having another mm -hmm. two weeks to digest and have the public hearing to digest, and then have a full discussion at the board level? I think it probably makes sense to, to meet again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure yeah because I think, I think we have a responsibility as a committee to come to consensus so that we can put it to the full board that we're all in agreement on it. We should not put it to the full board um, because it, it gives us a sense that we can come to consensus and therefore yes. <clears throat> it's a push off. So I think that we need more time to read, to absorb, and to understand. Thank you. Because I know I raised the issue um, about the increase for this for the community colleges, the $100, and I asked the question, if the country is pushing for free community colleges so that we can really fill the workforce, um, and we are adding $100, and I asked um, before, how much money is that, and why aren't we looking for other ways in which to fill that gap? I, I think I have a sense of the committee on this. Here's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is that we have this public hearing next week. Uh, two, 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 weeks, two weeks, sorry. sorry. Those of you who can attend, please do attend. I, I will be there. I, I agreed to be sure. there. <laughs> I'm chairing that. Uh, we'll then have uh, a, a sense of what others have to say. Uh, we can certainly uh, continue to reflect on what we said to each other here today and what this budget is. We can ask uh, for you all to schedule a special meeting of this committee for after the board meeting, and then to have in mind scheduling a board meeting. For after the public hearing. For after, between for the, after the October 26th board meeting and before the January 30th board meeting. I think yes. Why not so There's one week between the... No, I think what, what Chair well, Schwartz is saying is... What we're is saying to each other is this committee wants to meet again. Right. Mm -hmm. And this committee is not going to meet until after there's the public hearing, which is October 19, you said? And it doesn't sound to me as if we could shoehorn it before the October 26 meeting, although I'd perfectly be prepared to try if people are willing to do that, if we can. 
Uh, and then we could make or not a recommendation to the board on October 26th, or we could call for a special meeting of the board to deal with the budget after we've had adequate time to digest all this. So I'm probably mm -hmm. responsible in part for mm -hmm. this being in October now. I uh, looked at the schedule of the state and when they were putting together the budget that kind of thing and said we can't do this in late November anymore. We need to back this up. So we moved it into October so we'd have everybody have the, the board and others have the benefit to see what we're proposing before um, people in Albany are hard at work on that. So. Um, that was the goal, and I completely understand the interest in spending more time with this, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I guess the question I would have is that the board meeting is three weeks away. Is it possible that we could, if we're going to schedule this meeting, I hate to lose this three-week period, that uh, we can respond to the questions and any other questions. Um, we could all listen to the public hearing, uh, but I'm wondering if there's a way that we could still try to get a meeting in prior to the October 26th. I, I'm cognizant of the difficulty of getting all board members around the table at a special meeting later. And, I, and so if, we could, if there's some way we could take advantage of this in the three weeks, I think that would be... Mm -hmm. How helpful. do you all feel about trying to convene this committee either the 24th Monday or the 25th Tuesday of the week of the 24th with the full board meeting being the 26th? And if we don't reach the consensus that uh, Trustee oh, Clark sorry, spoke of. Excuse me. We have a meeting on Monday, 10 24, from 5 to 7, student affairs and special programs. I, I'm not much interested in other yeah. meetings. I'm interested in this committee. People will decide to I, attend whatever committee they want to attend. I'm just wondering how many of us would be at the borough hearing. Could we convene it immediately after the borough hearing? By then we'd have a chance to read through the material. Trustee Clover, I think the only thing to that is we don't know how many students will. I'm just full could disclosure. Be, could be bleary eyed. We right. can be there until 9, 10 p.m. So. Yeah. What was the date you proposed? So our board meeting is Wednesday, the 26th, the full right. board. I was suggesting since the public hearing is the 19th, which is a Wednesday, mm -hmm. that we meet the following Monday or Tuesday before the board meeting. That Monday is the 24th, that Tuesday is the 25th. 24th works for me. 24th works for me. I can do the 24th. Okay, so can we get a notice out that this committee will yes. reconvene yes. on October 24? Yes. Are you then officially motioning to table this? I, I don't know the answer yet. Nothing has been moved. One, one thing at a time. No resolution has been moved. Correct. There has been no motion. Robin. Uh, <coughs> may I, may so, I add something? Yeah. Please? Sure, please. Uh, we, we know I, I think. And again, I speak only for my own personal understanding of this document. I understand what it says. These are the high points. I want to see what's in between the lines, the details of the budget. Prospect not only for this year, but for the four-year plan. You know, those kinds of things we discussed in uh, broad terms at our last finance meeting, but certainly the things that... Uh, the information that we need to make an informed decision on setting this board forward to the board. Mm -hmm. So I think all of the things that yeah. we've requested, we should have before the meeting on the 24th. Certainly. We should have the, the chart prepared the way Trustee Mojica has suggested, including right. 2018. Mm -hmm. And if we could, since I have a commitment which I can't miss at 6 o'clock on the 24th, could we meet earlier in the day? Can What's earlier? Well, the morning meetings? Um, yes. No. Can't consider the Thursday or Friday prior. Uh, I I can't. Okay. I can't be. Here I can't do. Twenty fourth. So I. But twenty fourth is good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just suggest that, that also, I understand the dates that we're concerned about, but it's more important I think that we all reach consensus and are comfortable. I agree. And understand everything. I agree. So if it has to go past that date that we picked on the twenty seventh, then so be it. Yeah. Because it's better for us to be. So I think we should just. Yeah. It's okay. I think. People will understand if we go past those. So let's reflect the ambition of meeting on the 24th. Uh, let's try and do, can we do the morning? I can't do the morning, no, but I can do, do any time after 12 noon. So How's 12 noon? Any time after, after 12 noon. Any time after I have an orientation. 12, 12 noon. Can we impose upon you for lunch? <laughs> yes. Sure. Okay. <laughs> 12 <laughs> noon here. Yes. And we will reconvene this meeting. When? There is, for 12 noon on the 24th day of October, that's a Monday. Okay. 24th at noon? At noontime, here. 
for lunch and further discussion. It's Monday, October 24th. And, and Chair Schwartz, if I can, if I, can, yeah, please. I just yeah, want to I'll offer that day. to each of the committee members, so if there's mm -hmm. any discussion you'd like to have with me or folks from my team, um, any time between now and that meeting, more than happy to, to do it and to meet you wherever you'd like and answer whatever questions you have individually. Great. And I There's no motion, so we're not going to table anything. We're, we're just going to adjourn this meeting without having addressed the second item on the policy agenda. Great. Is that okay? Yeah. Very Marks. good. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. second. Thank you very much. Executive committee is meeting in this room in a few minutes.